once again to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where we're going to be at this morning. And uh, as you look around, you, you'll see that we're kind of uh, thin this morning. We, we have a, a, a lot kind of going on right now. And, uh, so I'm going to need your help uh, th this morning. <laughs> you're going to you're, you're gonna have to be more vocal than usual because uh, my, my amen choir uh, isn't here this morning. And so some of y'all will have to, uh, to, to fill the gap uh, for, for Ronnie and, and for... Uh, for Leslie, and Le Leslie's probably watching right now, but we can't we can't hear through the through the internet. And so, anyway, uh, let's give God the glory and, and give Him our attention this morning as we study His Word together. Uh, this morning, we're gonna uh, do something a little different. Uh, you've all been here these last uh, several weeks, and we've been talking about the resurrection of Christ, and and now. Uh, our focus will shift a little bit because the, the passage of Scripture begins to shift a little bit. Instead of focusing primarily on the resurrection of Christ, we're now going to be focusing today and, and next week on, on our resurrection, right? The resurrection of the, the believers. And we'll just look at these this one chunk this morning, verses 35 to 49. And, and I'll, I don't have to ask you, but I will. Are, are any of you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Right? Amen. Are any of you sick and tired of living with chronic aches and pains? Yes. All right, everybody say yes. Right, we know that. Um, because of the fall, we live in a world that is ravaged by sin. We know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't know already. Because of the fall, because of our own sins, our bodies and our minds, guess what? They're ravaged by sin too. Right, we're affected by sin. This is not the kind of world that God intended for us to inherit, to, to live in. This is not what He had planned for His image bearers. These are not the kinds of bodies that God intended for His image bearers to have either. This, is, this wasn't the way things were supposed to be. Genesis 1 tells us that once God was done creating everything at the end of the first five days of creation... Uh, everything that he had created, he said it was good, right? Day one, it was good. Day two, it was good. Day three, it was good. Day four, day five, it was good, right? He had created the heavens and the earth, the, the firmaments that divided the waters, the grass, the herbs, the sun, the moon, the stars, uh, the fish and the seas, the birds of the air. And, and then day six is significant. Day six, God said that everything was very good, right? So good, 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 good. Day six, very good. On the sixth day of creation, God created cattle, uh, creeping things and beasts is what the Word of God says. But of particular interest to you and me, God created the first two humans. Genesis 1, 27 says, God, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female, he created them. And so, that's the first six days. So what, what happened on day seven? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing happened. God rested from all the work that he had done. He, he blessed and sanctified the, the, the seventh day. And then the rest of Genesis 2 gives us more details about the life in the, in the garden there of Eden before the fall occurred. Uh, Genesis 2 also describes how God intended for creation to be for nature and humanity. Uh, also, it describes how the, the fellowship between uh, nature and, and humanity, how they were to, to interact with one another. But more importantly, uh, Genesis 2 describes uh, perfect fellowship between God and humanity. Right? And so what, what made everything perfect? Nothing had yet been corrupted by sin. Right? It was, it was paradise. Everything was absolutely perfect. But then, Genesis 3 happened. And we have been living with the consequences of sin and the fall ever since. But we've also been dying as a consequence of sin too. Just like God had told Adam what happened if he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? That's what God had told him about this. He had warned them about this. And we, we see this in Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. 
But God already had a plan, didn't He? God already had a plan. Yes, it's true that by the man Adam came death, and in Adam all died. Paul has already told us that in, in the uh, verses leading up to where we're at today. But more importantly, it's true that by the man Christ came the resurrection from the dead. And even though we die in Christ, that we shall be made alive by Christ, is what Paul has already told us. These past three Sundays have reminded us of the resurrection of Christ and why it matters so much to us as the people of God, but it also should encourage us and give us a reason to share our faith with others and why the resurrection matters to those who have not yet believed in Christ. So this morning we're going to be reminded of the resurrection of those who have believed in Christ as Lord and Savior. For those of us who have believed in Christ already, guess what? This life, no matter how good, no matter how bad it might be for, for, for us, this life is as close to hell as we'll ever get. Right? Get your mind around that. As bad as things are, this is as close to hell as we'll ever get. All the injustices, all the sicknesses, all the diseases and, and afflictions that we experience in this lifetime will seem only to be a light and, mo and momentary when compared to the glories of heaven, right? Whenever we, if, we're, if, we even, if we even think about this life once we're with the Lord, it will seem as light and momentary. One day we won't need medications, amen? One day we won't need injections. Stacy would say amen if he was here. Walking canes, why right? won't need them anymore. Hearing aids, won't need them anymore. Oxygen tanks and, and breathing machines, won't need them anymore. Won't need anything else that we use that we use now to help us along on our journey in this fallen world. One day, we will all have perfect bodies. One day, we will all have perfect minds. One day, we will all have perfect souls. One day we will all be totally free of the curse of sin and death once and for all. So the question is, when will that day be? Paul says, at Christ's coming. At Christ's coming. When he returns for his church and, and to, to reign and to rule on the earth for a thousand years. Again, we, we, we looked at that last week in verses 22 and 23. And then believers that have died before his return will be raised first and meet Christ in the air. And those who are alive and remain will be called together with them in the clouds. We see this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. And Paul again, he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we have we who are alive and remain until the, the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. These words are a great comfort to us this morning. So when will we be made perfect? When the last trumpet sounds at Christ's return. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead will be raised incorruptible and those who are alive will be changed. Perfect bodies, perfect minds, perfect souls. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We'll deal with all that next Sunday. So, so, so come back. If you're able, next Sunday we'll cover all this. For this morning, we have plenty to rejoice over regarding our resurrection as believers in our passage this morning. So let's get to it together. And so if you're able, let me ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 35, the Apostle Paul says, But some will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies, and, and what you sow you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, 
terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial one and the glory of the terrestrial one is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body, and so it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as, if, as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. This is God's word. Father, we thank you so much for your word before us today, God. And I pray that we are encouraged from your word this morning, God, as we have have. have looked into your word and as we have been reminded of the the the, the great blessing and, and the promise of uh, that come along with the resurrection of your son Jesus God today we are reminded of of the of our resurrection and, and, uh, and what life will be like for us and the, the bodies that we will have as, as we are raised gloriously uh, to, to be with you for all of eternity so father again let us be encouraged from your word this morning God teach us your word help us to apply the truth of your word and help us to help to tell others about your word and what we've learned today we love you and we ask these things in jesus name amen you may be seated the first thing that we see is the contention regarding the believer's resurrection contention verse 35 but someone will say how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? At first glance, this, this, these seem to be reasonable questions to ask, don't they? Right? They, they make sense. But, but we, can, we can't really be certain that if these were actual questions uh, by some of the Corinthians that they had for Paul, or if these are just theoretical questions that Paul came up with to address their doubts, because that's what we're dealing with. We're still dealing with the issue of them some in the church there were, were doubting the, the resurrection of the body. I believe the Apostle Paul, when I think of him, I think of him having like the, a mind of an attorney, right? And kind of the way he, he processes things and the way he's always anticipating what his, uh, his uh, adversaries or his opponents might be thinking. And so even after all the, the facts that Paul has laid out up to this point about the resurrection of Christ in particular, but also the resurrection of, of every believer in general, uh, some of them were still doubtful of the resurrection. Those that claimed to be so spiritually mature and to be so wise in the church there at Corinth were still quite contentious towards Paul on this matter of being raised from the dead. I imagine it would have gone something like this. Okay, Paul, Mr. Smarty Pants, Mr. Know-it-all, if you're such an expert on the topic of re resurrection, if the dead are raised up like you claim they are, how are the, the dead raised up? That's probably how it would go, something along those lines. I, that's how I imagine it to be. If the dead are bodily raised from the dead, with what, what kind of body do they come if they're raised? You see, what those Corinthian skeptics may have really been questioning is this. How, how can a natural sinful body become a supernatural spiritual body? That's what they had a hard time with. That's, that, that's what they couldn't grasp. And I think if we're honest this morning, some of us probably have our own questions about how the resurrection will happen and how our bodies will be transformed, right? If we're, if we're, if we're willing to have that discussion, some of us probably have questions as well. God knew that we'd have questions, and that's why He's given us His Word, amen? Yeah. He gives us His Word to, 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 to answer these questions. See, God's Word doesn't answer all of our questions, but it answers most of them, Amen? Most of them are answered for us. You see, some people say we're not, we're not supposed to question God, right? That you just don't do that. That's something that you don't do. That's a no-no. But you see, I don't think that's 100% that's accurate. God doesn't have a problem with people seeking to understand more about Him. 
That's not a problem. God doesn't have a problem with people seeking to understand more about His Word. That's not an issue. But God does have a problem with people seeking to misrepresent who He is. Right? That's an issue. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't put up with that. He, he, he has a problem with people seeking to misrepresent what His Word says to other people. You see, God does have a problem with people, especially saved people, that stir up contention in the local church and cause other saved people to doubt what God's Word says. That was happening in Corinth. And guess what? It still happens in churches all over the world still today. The same thing happens. So how do we know that Paul was posing these questions to those who were stirring up contention within the church at Corinth regarding the resurrection? Because of what Paul said in the beginning in verse 36, he, he said they were foolish. He called them fools, right? That's how we know. The second thing that we see is Comparisons regarding the believer's uh, resurrection. Verses 36 to 41 is where we see this. What Paul had uh, written already should have been sufficient. right? It should have been enough to, to satisfy their doubts, but apparently they were still not convinced of the validity of the body resurrection of the believer. It was just uh, inconceivable for them, but, but, but again, they were wrong. Like Jesus is long-suffering towards us, Paul was also long-suffering towards the Corinthians, as I've said before, I think about the Corinthian church. They were his problem child. They, they, did get, they frustrated him and infuriated him and disappointed him, attacked him. But, but yet Paul kept on trying to, to, to love them and, and to teach them and encourage them. And, and he had to, to be persistent in doing this. Paul wanted, wanted to, to, to do away with this misunderstanding. He wanted them to, to be able to... And, 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 and joy and lay hold of the hope and the joy that belonged to them because of their faith in Christ. And see, if they had no confidence in the body of resurrection, that would hinder that for them. Paul's going to do whatever he could do to clear things up. And, and I would just say this, I think we should be willing to do the same. Right? Do, do some of us have misunderstandings or wrong understandings? Or, or do we know people that have questions about the faith and the God's Word? Absolutely we do. And we need to be willing to do what we, we can do with the leadership of God to, to be able to answer those questions to clear up any confusion that we can. To clear things up, Paul compared the resurrection of a believer to three things that the Corinthians could easily identify with so they could better understand, or, or at least they were, if they were willing to, they could. The first comparison that Paul gave was an agricultural comparison in verses 36 to 38, we see this. He says, beginning again, Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps weed or some other grain, but God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. After addressing them as being foolish for doubting the resurrection of the bodies of believers, Paul started off, I think, simple for them. Uh, the, the, this first comparison should have been the easiest one for them to understand because they would know how a, a crop grows, how that process works. It was an agrarian culture, and so they'd have been familiar with this one. You see, we don't bury people's bodies unless they are dead first, or at least we shouldn't, <laughs> right? <coughs> and what happens after that That that. That process happened, it's hidden from the world, and we're thankful for that. We don't want to see that. We don't want to think about that, what happens. A seed of wheat or some other grain appears to be lifeless, but once it's sown into the ground, it is made alive and it's transformed into something completely different. So the question is, how does that happen? God does it. Right? God does it. He, he gives the body as He pleases, Paul says, and to each seed its own body. God gives each seed that is sown into the ground its own body. What I think Paul was doing here, he was comparing our current physical bodies to seeds that get sown into a field. And once our bodies die and are buried like seeds that get sown as believers, our physical bodies will be raised and transformed into a body much, much different than what was buried or sown. Praise God for that. As believers, our physical bodies are sown into the ground in corruption, and when Christ returns, they will be raised in in corruption. The second comparison that Paul gave was a, of, a, of an animal-type 
comparison. Verse 39 says, All flesh is not the same, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. The second comparison has been, would have been a little harder for them to understand. And I can say amen, because as I was studying, I was having a hard time trying to put this together and, and pull this out. But, but what, I, what, I, what I came to understand is what Paul was probably trying to communicate was all flesh is not the same. And by saying that, uh, every living being and creature that God has created is distinct and different from one another, right? That we, we, I, I hope we, we'd understand that, that we're not all the same. Everyone doesn't have, uh, every type of creature, created being does not have equal value and worth. People aren't the same as animals, though some would disagree with that. There are some, some people have their fur babies, right? Anybody have fur babies in here? Anybody? <laughs> right? Fur babies. I like, like to put clothes on their dogs and, and carry them around and, 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 and baskets and purses. And you go, to, you go shopping nowadays and everybody has their dog with them, right? All that kind of stuff. So some people have, would disagree with that one. Uh, bears aren't the same as fish, and fish aren't the same as birds. It's, and, and no two people are exactly the same. No two animals are exactly the same. No two fish are exactly the same. No two birds are exactly the same. And, 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 and one commentary I used that, that noted this, even identical twins are not exactly the same. Right? They, they don't have the same fingerprints. Right? They have different DNA. And so they may appear to be the same, but they're not exactly the same. And so what was Paul's point with this comparison? I believe his point is that in the resurrection of believers, each person will, be, will still be distinct. Will still be distinct. You will still be distinctly you, but you will be a glorified and perfected you. Right? I will still be distinctly me, but I will be a glorified and, per, and perfected me. The, Paul, the point Paul was making here is that our resurrected bodies will be different and distinct from everyone else's resurrected bodies. James Merritt's insights, I believe, are helpful here. He said this, We're not going to be carbon copies of one another post-resurrection. We're going to be different than, than just, just, different then, just as we are now, but our resurrected bodies will be of the same quality. I think that's what Paul was trying to communicate here in this the second one. The third comparison that Paul gave was an astrological comparison. We see this in verses 40 and 41. It says, There are celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. I think Paul's emphasis here in this third comparison was on the glory that every individual resurrected body will possess. You see, we can tell the difference between a celestial body and a terrestrial body by the way it looks. Mainly its, its brightness or its glory is what Paul's talking about here. The brightness of the sun is, is a one type of glory. The brightness of the moon is one type of glory. And actually, the brightness of the moon is not its own glory, but it's reflecting the glory of the sun. Right? And so he... But, but we can tell that, the, 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 the difference, the, the brightness of each individual star is one type of glory. That's how astronomers are able to tell them apart, right? I can't tell them apart, but they can do it. They got the big telescopes and they got them named and numbered and all that. But they can tell because of the, they're distinct. The colors are, are different. The brightness are different. I believe this gives us reason to believe that we will recognize one another in heaven. Some of, some of us are thankful for that and others are not, <laughs> right? Right? In a sense, we'll be the, be the same in kind as we are here, but we will be changed. I will still resemble what I look like to some extent, and so will you, but we will be perfected. So there's hope. And some would say, well, and, and I thought this myself, because that's another one of those questions that we just don't know, and I'm not sure why we ask, and Say, well, what, what am I going to be? The, is it, am I going to be young or middle aged? Or I'm going to be, well, how's that going to work? And again, those are questions that we have, but I don't think they really matter. It doesn't matter. But I think about we, we're, we're not we're going to recognize each other, but it'll be different. It's going to be kind of like the the way that Mary was not able to recognize Jesus at first after his resurrection. Right? Remember, she thought he was the gardener. Right? She she knew what he looked like, but before the before he was crucified, before he was placed in the tomb, she knew what he looked like. She'd spent all that time with him, and, and yet 
There he was standing right before her and she could not recognize him. Let's just, let's just look at that right quick. John 20, 11 to 16. It says, But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped, stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in the white uh, sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried, away, carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Teacher. See, she wasn't quite able to make out who he was at, at, at first. So how is that going to work exactly? Right? How is this going to work exactly? And I'm going to tell you again, I've said it a lot these last few weeks. I don't know. I don't know exactly because the Bible doesn't tell us how exactly, does it? I, I have the... You know, you and I, we have the same Bibles, right? We have maybe different translations. So you have access to all the information that I do. We don't know. But I do know this. I believe what the Bible does tell us about the resurrection. I know that. And I know this too. I believe that nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for Him. The third thing that we see in our text is contrast. Contrast regarding the believer's resurrection, verses 42 to 45. I'm thinking to myself as I'm working through this text, that these, these three comparisons, were if, if they were not enough, Paul was now going to give them four contrasts to remind them of the benefits that every believer will have in the resurrection. And Paul again continues to use the agricultural analogy because it was probably easiest for him to make their make his point uh, to them. He was trying to make things easier for them to understand, not harder. Trying to make things easier for them and uh, to understand, not harder. We should be making things easier for people to understand, not harder. When I preach, I'm trying to make things easier for you to understand and not harder. Amen? That should be our goal. The first contrast that Paul gave people a gate between a believer's pre-resurrection body and post-resurrection body is given in verse 42. He says, so, he says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in, in corruption. So even though our sins are forgiven us and we are reconciled with God through our faith in Christ, our bodies still experience the corrupting effects of sin. I mean, I mean we've We've talked about this already. Even as we sit here this morning, some of us are uncomfortable. Some of us are experiencing pain and discomfort. As we sit here, we have a, a, a loved one, a brother in Christ who's in the hospital awaiting surgery because of the corruption of sin, right? In his body. We know this to be true. The wages of sin is still physical, de physical death for those of us who are in Christ. That doesn't go away. When, I, when we as... When we die as believers, our corrupted bodies are buried, but in the resurrection they will be raised in incorruption, untouched and untainted by sin. Untouched and untainted by sin. And what a glorious day that will be. The second thing, that, that, uh, and third contrast that Paul gave between a believer's pre-resurrection body and post-resurrection body are, are in verse 43. It says it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. We've all been to funerals before, and we've heard people make comments trying to be a comfort to the family by saying things like this. Oh, man, the, the, you know, he looks good, or, or she looks good, or they look to be at peace, right? You, 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 you've heard people say that, and maybe you, you've said that. We mean well, right? We don't, we don't always know what to say. Right? We, we, we want to try to comfort people and sometimes the best thing for us to say is to say nothing. But, but you said it, you know, maybe said these things or heard these things said. Some funeral homes do a better job than others preparing bodies for viewing before the burial, but no amount of makeup is going to cover up death. 
Right? No, no amount of makeup is going to cover up death. You can't fix that. There is nothing glorious. There is nothing powerful about a dead body. That's what Paul was making clear. Death is the ultimate display of weakness and dishonor to the body of an image bearer of God, but death does not have the last say on a believer's body. Praise the Lord. Yes, our bodies may be sown in dishonor and in weakness, because of, but because of our faith in Christ, our bodies will be raised in glory and in power, is what Paul's saying here. But we'll deal more with that in detail next Sunday morning, Lord willing. The fourth and final contrast that Paul gave between a believer's pre-resurrection body and post-resurrection body are in verses 44 and 45. It says it is sown a natural body, is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a living, life-giving spirit. Have you noticed that Paul keeps saying or using the word body? over and over and over again, right? If you were just to take your highlighter and every time it says body, just, just color that in or highlight it. It's almost like he's trying to, 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 to overstate something, to, to, to emphasize something, doesn't it? Because he is. Isn't, isn't that the issue that the Corinthians had or some of them is that they believed in the resurrection, like the, the soul would be raised and, and, and be with the Lord, and, and, but they, they rejected the bodily resurrection. Right? That was their hang-up. That was their issue. And so that's why he keeps on using this word over and over again, trying to, to help them to, 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 to get this through their heads. I think verses 44 and 45 are, are a, a direct rebuke of that type of thinking, denying the, the bodily resurrection. Right? We are all born with natural bodies that are like the first man, Adam. Like the first man, Adam, our natural bodies are corrupted by sin. We have the same nature that, that, that was passed down to us from, from Him. Like the first Adam, our bodies will break down and eventually die and be buried. But in the resurrection, as believers, we will receive spiritual bodies like the last Adam. Right? Like the last Adam. And, and who is the last Adam? And what will our spiritual bodies be like? Jesus. Jesus. There you go. The last Adam is Christ as we'll see more clearly in verses 46 to 49. Our spiritual bodies will be flesh and blood, physical bodies, just like the body that Christ had after He was raised from the dead. Our spiritual bodies will be perfect in every way because they will be completely free from the corruption of sin. And that's the difference, right? Perfect bodies. Our spiritual bodies will be free from the corruption of sin. Our spiritual bodies will be perfectly suited for the everlasting life that we will enjoy as the citizens of heaven. Paul wrote about this and how Christ will transform our lowly natural bodies himself. He will do this. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the work by which he is able even to subdue all things to him. So, if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what I don't know what to say. The fourth thing, fourth thing that we see, the last thing that we see is the confirmation regarding the believer's resurrection. Now, early, earlier, I made the, the statement that Paul was like a lawyer uh, presenting his case to a to a jury. At this point, he's laid out all the facts <laughs> regarding the bodily resurrection of the the believer. He's given comparisons. He's given contrast to strengthen his case. And now all that's left for him to do is to make his closing remarks. His closing remarks that will confirm all that he has already said. Look again at verses 46 to 49. It says, However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who were made of dust. And, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. See, even though we've been forgiven of all of our sins through our faith in Christ, 
Even though we have been reconciled with God through our faith in Christ, we are still limited by our natural bodies. We are new creations, right? That Paul tells us this. We are new creations in Christ, but we will not truly be made new until we receive our new spiritual bodies in the resurrection. Until then, Paul says we are like the first man, Adam. The, he calls him the man of dust. <laughs> the man of dust. Until then, we must bear the image of the man of dust too. That means that we live with the limitations and the consequences that sin has on the natural body. But one day, church, one day the second man, the Lord from heaven, will return for us. Will return for His people. Return for His church. On the day of resurrection, those who are in Christ will receive a spiritual body. On the day of resurrection, those who are in Christ will become like the heavenly man and bear the image of the heavenly man for all of eternity. So what did Paul mean by this? Because Christ experienced bodily resurrection as the first fruit, so will every person that believes in Him as Lord and Savior. He said all of that just to say this, right? To say this one thing, to nail this down for the Corinthians and for us who have believed. So this morning as I, I close, I, I want to close by, by mentioning or, or, or adding one more contrast. It's not in the text, but it's biblical. I'm not, I'm not adding to the Scriptures. I'm just, this is something I want us to point out while we're thinking about contrast. Those who have believed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will experience everlasting life and that's a promise from God's Word. In contrast, those who have not believed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will experience everlasting condemnation. Guess what? That also is a promise from God's Word. And some may say, well, where does the Bible say that? I'm glad you asked. You should always. If you're not sure, that's a good question to ask. John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, what I've come to, to know in my lifetime, and I'm sure that you have as well, is that we have an enemy. We have an adversary. <coughs> the devil. And guess what he's notorious for? Lying. He's a liar. Everyone does not go to a better place when they die. That's another one of those statements that you hear a lot at, at funeral homes. Oh, well, they're, they're, they're in a better place now. If they're a believer, that's true. But if they're not, they're not in a better place. Only those that believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior go to a better place when they die. Only those who have believed in Jesus Christ Lord and Savior will be raised in incorruption, will be raised in glory, and be raised in power. That's what Paul was telling us this morning from this passage. Only those that believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will be raised from the dead and receive new spiritual bodies and be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. But what about everyone else, Brother Mike? What happens to everyone else? According to Revelation 20.15, they will be cast into the lake of fire. I know that's not popular. <laughs> Nobody likes to hear that. Nobody wants to believe that, but that's what God's Word says. And so we have a choice this morning. We always have a choice. People have a choice as long as we have the ability and the capacity to, to make decisions. We have a, a, a air in our lungs. We still have life in our bodies. We have a, a choice to make. Either we can believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, we can turn from our sins, follow Him, become His disciples, or we can say no to Jesus and not follow Him and, and reject all this book as nonsense and fairy tales. Our, consequent, our, our decisions have consequences. Tremendous consequences, eternal consequences. And so I'll just ask you this morning, have you believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior yet? And if you have, are you living in hope of the resurrection? Right? All this that we've looked at this morning, all that we've thought about in this text, that, that as the people of God, 
we should be encouraged. We should be excited. Yes, our, our bodies are failing us. Our bodies are breaking down. And, and we, we're tired. We're sick and tired of being sick and tired. We're, we're, <laughs> I'm not as old as some of you, but I, I still I wake up some days and I, and I hurt. I didn't do anything. I just slept last night. I woke up and, I, and I'm hurting. Why is that? Corruption. Corruption. It's, it's the effect, it's the consequences of sin. That we live in a fallen world and we are fallen people. Do you live with hope of the resurrection? If not, all that can change. If you have believed in Jesus, you can believe in Him today. If you don't have resurrection hope, you can have it today. But again, the choice is yours. Nobody can make it for you. If I could make it for you, I would. Everyone would be saved. If I, could, if I had the power to, to choose for someone to whether they would believe in Jesus, I would make sure everyone believes. But that's not the way it works. You have to believe for yourself. You see, nobody will be in heaven against their will. But nobody will be in a lake of fire against their will either. If you're in heaven in eternity, if you have a resurrected a spiritual body and spend all eternity with Christ because you chose that here and now. If you wind up in the lake of fire, you chose that too by the decision that you made here in this lifetime. Let's make sure we choose wisely. Amen? Let me pray. We'll have a time of response. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your word before us this morning. God, we're so thankful that when we talk about and we read about the, the, the resurrection, the bodily res resurrection, that we're not, <laughs> we're not reading fables and, and fairy tales. We're reading facts. Because Christ died and was buried and rose again, those who are uh, in Christ, those who have turned from their sins, those who have believed in Him as Lord and Savior, they will be raised. We will be raised bodily as well and have spiritual bodies perfect bodies perfect minds perfect souls oh God we look forward to that day but until then God help us to be faithful help us to keep trusting you help us to keep being faithful to do what you have called us to do help us to tell others help us to warn others of the judgment to come Help us point them to Jesus. Tell them about the everlasting life, the forgiveness of sins, the, the grace that He offers. If they would turn to Him, if they would believe in Him. God, thank You for being a, a gracious God towards us. Father, we thank You for the promise of the resurrection. And we look forward to that day. Come, Lord Jesus. We ask these things in His name. Amen.